Why were there so many disappointing books this month? Oh my gosh. Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. Today's video is my May reading wrap up. And I'm gonna tell you this is probably gonna be a really long video, longer than usual. If you are familiar with my channel, you probably know I usually do a mid month wrap up because of how many books I read. This month, because of things that happen with our family, I did not do a mid month wrap up. So we're gonna talk about all the books that I read the entire month in this video. <laughs> Honestly, it's entirely possible, depending on how soon my kids come home, that I might have to like film part of this now and part of it later. You know what? We're, we're gonna do what we can. But as always, I am gonna begin with some stats. I enjoy them. I'm a stats nerd. If you wanna skip forward to the place where I actually start reviewing the books, you're more than welcome to do so. But for those of you who like the stats like me, Let's go ahead and dive into my May stats. In May, I read 31 books for a total of 9,168 pages, which is an average page count of 298 pages per day. The total number of books that I've read sounds high, but I think you can see with the pages read and my average pages per day that this was actually quite a low reading month for me because of some personal things that happen with our family. The reason for the higher than usual total number is because I read some graphic novels, I read a couple of picture books, I read a manga this month and you know some shorter novellas and stuff. I did have some lengthier books as well but you know I would pay less attention to the total number of books that I read and instead my average pages. My typical average I'm aiming for is 350 to 360 pages per day. Sometimes I go above that so 295 a day is is definitely on the low side for me. In the month of May, 17 of the books that I read were advanced reader copies or books sent to me for review. I had one DNF, and we'll talk about that. I read four graphic novels or manga. So three graphic novels, one manga, I told you, and those go really quick. Seven of the books that I read were indie or small press. Three of them were translated from other languages, and one was a reread. So we had kind of a an array of things going on there. In terms of format, Audiobooks are usually my highest read thing that was true this month as well, but it was less of a big proportion than usual. In May, I read 10 physical books, four ebooks, and 17 audiobooks. And taking a look at those audiobooks, seven of them are what I term shelf, which means I had a physical copy on my TBR shelf and I got it off via audio or primarily via audio. Sometimes I do a blended read. And in terms of where those audiobooks were coming from, this month three of them were from Audible, four of them were from Libra FM, including I think at least one audio review copy. If you're interested in checking out Libra FM, I do have a link down below and they are wonderful because their proceeds go to support local indie bookstores. So check them out if you're an audiobook listener. I had seven audio review copies from NetGalley and three of these were from Scribd. So <laughs> we had a lot of a lot of NetGalley audiobooks this month. Taking a look at target demographics, this is also unusual. I typically read predominantly for adults and while I did read more for adults than anything else, I read a lot of things for younger audiences this month more than usual. 17 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience, nine of them were YA, two were middle grade, and two were children's books. Yeah, it was, an, it was a, an, an unusual month in a lot of ways. In terms of publication date, the earliest published book that I read this month was from 1995. In total, I read seven books that were backlist published prior to 2022. I read seven books published in 2022, and I read 17 books published in 2023. In terms of author demographics, my goal is to prioritize reading books from marginalized authors, and so I check these benchmarks every month. My aim is to read about 50% from Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors, and at least 25% from openly queer authors. In May, I read 47% from Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors, which is pretty good, especially given the month that I had, and 30% of the books that I read were from openly LGBT plus authors, which is great. Next up, let's look at genre. Definitely by far fantasy and romance were my most read genres this month, which I think makes a lot of sense given that those are my comfort genres. And I was leaning into that this month. I was for a good chunk of it really leaning into what felt like what I wanted to be reading and what felt comforting. So 12 of the books that I read were fantasy, 
eight of them were romance, and more specifically, four of them were contemporary romance, one was historical romance, and three were speculative romance. Speculative is going to be your sci-fi, fantasy, or paranormal romance. Three of the books that I read were contemporary fiction, three thrillers, one horror, one general nonfiction, one poetry, and one science fiction. So less horror and sci-fi this month than previous months, but again, I'm, I'm all right with that. Next up, let's take a look at star ratings. And overall, I had really strong ratings. I was reading things I wanted to be reading for the most part. And I think that shows in what I ended up rating things. This month, I did not give any books one star. One book got one and a half stars. I did not give any books two or two and a half stars. Five books got three stars. One book got three and a half stars. 11 books got four stars. As per usual, that was my most given rating. Three books got four and a half stars. Six books got five stars. So pretty heavy on five stars. And three books got six stars. And in my personal rating scale, a six star read is a favorite of the year. I had three of them this month. So overall, really fantastic. My average star rating for the month was 4.0. I mean, that's great. It was my birthday month, so <laughs> like at least there was something that went well. <laughs> uh, it was not the month I had hoped for entirely, but I did have a fun time for my birthday. So anyway, finally, let's take a look at how I'm doing with my challenge TBRs for the year. There is not much progress, except that one of them is now complete. I've read two out of the five books on my classics TBR. I've read two out of the five books on my sci-fi fantasy TBR. I've read four out of the six books on my nonfiction TBR, and I have completed my Star Wars. TBR. All six of those have been read. Yay. <laughs> so those are my stats. With that said, we're going to go ahead and talk about all the books that I read this month. There is a lot to go through and a good chunk of these books I talked about at greater length in a reading vlog where I let my patrons pick my TBR. I, if you haven't seen that yet, I will link it up above. It was a lot of fun. Like how good were they at picking things they thought I would love. So I'm going to let you know when I get to a book that was in that video what it was and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail just for the sake of time because this is going to be a long video y'all. Get a drink, get a snack, and come back and join me. If you're new to how I do this I start with my DNFs and then go from my lowest rated books up to my highest rated books to end on a high note. So I had one DNF this month and it was definitely a disappointment. This was one that I had been highly anticipating and you know it's really unfortunate because this is an author who has written some of my all-time favorite books but this is the second book in a row from her that I have struggled with. <laughs> um, so maybe I just need to like be a little more cautious. That is A Crown of Glass and Ivy by Claire Legrand. I was very excited about this. It's the start of her first adult fantasy romance series. The books are all inspired by ballets, which sounds amazing. <sighs> I have very complicated feelings about this book. I ultimately ended up DNFing it at 27%. And I, I'm gonna say that I don't know how much of it is the author specifically and how much of it is the publisher she's working with and the editor she's working with and what they want her to lean into because this does read like a book that a, a lot of people on TikTok might eat up or like it's pandering to that crowd to a certain extent and the problem with that is that the things that were working for me in the story just don't fit <laughs> that. And so it feels very discordant. And I just was like, I can't, I can't deal with this. And based on other reviews I'm seeing, I think it was just going to get worse. So here's the thing. The main character is a young woman who is dealing with chronic pain and disability, as well as mental health challenges. And to me, that was the part that felt the most raw and the most real. And I think if it was a book that was leaning into that and was going in a darker direction than I think what this book wants to do, it might have worked. But instead, this is trying really hard to be a sexy fantasy romance. So what we have is like a love interest I don't really care for, lots of references to sex at inopportune times and like the main character thinking about sex at inopportune and inappropriate moments. It feels like it's trying really hard to be sexy and to hit this particular demographic. And then she's also making a lot of choices that are reckless. There are plot holes and world building holes that I'm noticing that don't 
really make a lot of sense and some conveniences and it's one of those things where plot holes and conveniences and stuff I can look past if I'm having a good time. There are definitely books that I have loved that have those things if I look at them objectively but because I'm having a good time it's fine. In this case I was not having a good time and so they felt much more glaring. I finally decided to just cut my losses at 27% and DNF it because I was like this is a long book and it is too long for me to keep going especially given what I'm seeing in other reviews. I feel like it was only gonna get worse <laughs> from from where it was. So I am really bummed because again Clara Legrand has written a couple of my all-time favorite books. I really really love a lot of her work and there are elements of this book that work but I was just so irritated by the things that didn't I couldn't put up with it. Now your mileage may vary depending on what things bother you depending on if you mind that. I think there are people who are going to eat this up and really enjoy it but sadly it just it was not for me so <sighs> I'm bumped and it's long it is a long book it's almost 500 pages yeah it, it was a no with that said let's move on to the books that I did finish and we will start with uh, my other big disappointment of the month oh man y'all <laughs> this is the only book that I rated less than three stars this month and I'm so sad because it is a book that I thought I was going to love from an author, again, who has written books that I really, really love. It, this was not the one. <laughs> so sad. This is Witch King by Martha Wells. Oh, man. Um, listen, Martha Wells wrote The Murderbot Diaries, which I adore. She also wrote another earlier fantasy book that you're going to see later in this video that I loved. It was great. <laughs> this... <sighs> it's got a lot of interesting ideas, okay? The idea behind the plot setup and the some of the ideas behind the world building are interesting, but the way that she tells it is so convoluted. There's two different timelines and I think it's intended to build suspense for the reader. Instead it's just confusing because it's hopping back and forth and you don't really know what's going on. The other thing about it is I didn't care about any of the characters. I wasn't invested in them. It was just very dry. I struggled to finish this one. I was like I'm gonna finish it. Maybe it'll get better. I no. No, it, it was a one and a half star for me. I didn't completely hate it. There was some value to this in terms of the ideas, like the seeds of some things that could have been interesting with these sort of demons who like inhabit human bodies and are immortal and the main character is one of them and there's a lot of political stuff going on, but it is so confusing and so convoluted. The way it was explained didn't make a lot of sense to my brain and I just didn't care. I was not invested enough in it. One thing about this too is when you're in the perspective perspective of a pretty much immortal character, which is what we are here. We have an immortal being as our main perspective. You really need to make me care about them and you really need to make me care about their relationships with other people. Otherwise, it's hard to be that invested in a character like that and other people may disagree, other people may end up loving Kai, but I was never invested in Kai or in any of his relationships with other people. Again, I like that it's a queer norm world. I like that it's playing with things like gender identity. I think the specific mechanics of how the like inhabitation of bodies and the different planes and realm stuff is interesting in theory, but the way this was put together was so convoluted. I just, it was not, I was not having a good time. It was not the opposite of fun to read, which is a bummer. So this is going to be in the category of one of my most disappointing books of the year. <sighs> yeah, so like the two on the low end were real big disappointments, but the majority of the things that I read were pretty good. I do have another disappointment, but it wasn't as dramatic as this. So it's unfortunate, but I can't I can't recommend this. I'll just be excited for the next Murderbot book coming out in November. <laughs> Moving on, let's talk about my three star reads. This month I had five of them. The first one I had as an audio review copy on NetGalley. This is The Nameless Restaurant by Tao Wong. The subtitle of it was like a cozy cooking fantasy. And as 
somebody who is discovering a real love for cozy fantasy, I was like, yes, let me snap that up. It's a novella. It's pretty short. This sounds like a lot of fun. And I did like it, but I didn't love it. I, I probably should have thought through the fact that it said cozy cooking fantasy, because I think in my brain, I was thinking, oh, this is going to be a cozy book about a restaurant that's going to be focused on like descriptions of the food with fantasy elements. Now, there is some description of the food in terms of like what it's like to eat it, the experience of eating it, but really more of the description is the method of preparing it, which I just did not find that interesting. Now, if I was more into cooking, I probably would have liked that part better. And I could see for somebody reading it who's into cooking specifically, finding the detail on that very cozy. I just, I'm more interested in the descriptions of the experience of the food, the flavors and the tastes and what it's like. And that really wasn't where the focus was. I do like the premise of this though. It's set in Toronto, Canada, and it's this immortal being who is a chef at a secret restaurant that gets mundane and magical patrons. And it all takes place one night at the restaurant. He cooks whatever he wants and rotates the cuisines. This particular night he's cooking, I think, Malaysian food, which is fun. And there's some drama and different things going on with the patrons who are coming in to order the food. So I did like this. I did enjoy it. I didn't love it as much as I had hoped to, which is why it's a three star read for me. But if that sounds appealing, I would recommend it. It was fun. My next three star read is one of my more disappointing reads of the month. And this is a book that I talk about at greater length in that patrons pick my TBR vlog. So I'm going to direct you there, but that is Bloodmarked by Tracy Dion. <sighs> I'm bummed because I really loved Legendborn a lot, and I had heard people say that generally people who loved Legendborn are loving this, and people who had problems with Legendborn are having problems with this. I am one of those weird people who loved Legendborn but had a lot more issues with Bloodmarked. It was fine, like I still liked it reasonably well, but it was a disappointment. I hoped to love it and there were just like, I had I had more, more things that stood out to me. Again, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into detail. Check out my Goodreads review or go and check out the vlog that I did if you wanna hear my specific thoughts <laughs> about this book, but it was definitely a disappointment. Three stars. I also gave three stars to The Prophet, a graphic novel adaptation by Khalil Gibran, script by A. David Lewis. This I picked up recently at the U.S. Book Show, and I thought this was kind of a cool idea. It's an adaptation of poetry as a graphic novel, and I like nonfiction graphic novels, so I thought that this might be fun. It was a mixed experience. Sometimes I liked having the visuals and it added something, and sometimes it felt more distracting and irritating than anything else. I will say though, this feels like a nice way to be eased into some of his poetry if that's something you're looking for. And I, you know, somebody who hasn't read The Prophet in its entirety and has meant to do so, this has whet my appetite to go and read it. It philosophizes on lots of things, love, marriage, death, the economy. There's a lot of really interesting things. I don't, yeah. Um, you know, it's poetry, really, what can I say? But I didn't love the art. It was fine. Sometimes it added something, sometimes it didn't. Three stars. I also gave three stars to Cult of Personality by Cole McCade. So <laughs> this is kind of a weird case of Libro FM offered an influencer review copy for the seventh novella in a series. <laughs> so... Uh, take what I say about this with a grain of salt, because I have not read the previous novellas, right? Like there's been a lot building up to this one. And I think probably if you had read all the way through and you were more invested in the characters and what was happening, I could see this being more of a hit than it was for me. As it is, I liked it, but I didn't love it entirely. I have read something from Cole McCabe in the past and I enjoyed their work. So this is a queer romantic suspense following two police detectives. And it has a little bit of a paranormal spin to the larger story. But this one in particular is dealing with a cult, which I enjoy. I will say one thing that's worth noting is that this seems to be the book that starts right after 
these two guys who for the last few novellas as partners have been building up to something finally get together. And so it ends up having a lot of steamy scenes in it <laughs> because you can tell from context clues that they kissed for the first time probably in the last novella and so this is where there's the big payoff. As somebody who's coming into this for the first time I'm kind of like wow this is a lot of sex for a novella um, with two characters that I'm not yet invested in but I think if you'd probably read all the way up you would like it better. I did enjoy this. I like Cole McCade's writing. I think they have some interesting things. So if you're looking for that kind of a queer romantic suspense story and you're interested in something dealing with religious cults because that's what you get here, I would recommend it. Three stars. My final three star read is another one that was a disappointment that I talked about in a video. This is The Princess and the Scoundrel by Beth Rivas. I read this for my May the 4th Star Wars project, which I will link up above. Man, I had so much fun making that video and not very many people have watched it. So I don't know if it's because I'm a woman reading Star Wars books or what it is, but like y'all, it's fine. The, the like 600 of you who watched it and loved it I appreciate you. It's I, I'm glad I did it. It was fun. That said, this was maybe my least favorite of the books that I read and the one that I had the most high hopes for. It is I, I wanted it to be more of a actual romance and it's just not really that and I don't know why I was expecting a Star Wars book to be that but again check out that vlog if you want to hear my detailed thoughts but this was not quite what I was hoping for. It was still fine. I still had a reasonably good time with it so three stars but not everything that I hoped it would be. Oh, <laughs> actually, y'all, you know what? Scratch that. This was my one three and a half star read. I, uh, okay, I had another disappointment though. This was three and a half stars. I only had one three and a half star read. My other three star read is, oh, I forgot I had this one. This was a big disappointment. <laughs> Why was why were there so many disappointing books this month? Oh my gosh, there were. There were like four books that I had been really anticipating reading that did not do what I hoped that they would do. So the other one is Court of the Undying Seasons by A.M. Strickland. And listen, this is not a bad book. I gave it three stars. Um, the thing you should know though is if you may have seen this if you watched my book haul video because I pre-ordered this book thinking I was gonna love it and then I had an advanced copy on Neck Alley so I read it before it arrived and it was very disappointing. I ended up returning it because I don't need it on my shelves. It's a three-star read. I loved the last two books from A.M. Strickland sped through them, ate them up. They were everything that I wanted and I was really hopeful about this one. It is a upper YA kind of dark vampire fantasy romance. Why were there so many disappointing books this month? Oh my gosh. And I do think that there are a lot of people who will enjoy this but it didn't hit the way I was hoping for. Part of the problem I think is that and you know unless you're really cautious, this is sort of baked in with vampire stories often. But in this case, especially because there's a vampire school and there's a love interest who is a mentor to a student, it's just got power dynamics that are really iffy for me. On top of which, this book felt very slow and weirdly paced to me. There were parts of it that I was really into and parts of it that I enjoyed and then parts of it that really dragged. And again, that is quite different from previous books that I've read from this author where I sort of flew right through them. I think there was an attempt to do deeper and more world building, but I just don't know how substantive some of that stuff was and instead we just get, I, I don't know. I, it just it, it was fine. It was not a bad book and I do think there are people who are gonna probably love it but for me it was a disappointment. It wasn't what I was hoping for. I, I will pick up whatever this author writes <laughs> in the future. What did I say in my review? Let me like let me look at my review just to see. I wasn't hooked in and pulled along in the same way that I was with their last books. It's a bit slower, less propulsive. With a main character I felt middle of the road about. Yeah, I, that's the other thing. I didn't have strong feelings 
about the main character. In this, a girl named Finn volunteers to take the place of the girl she secretly loves at a vampire school. There she must either succeed in winning the favor of three or more courts and become a vampire or fail and become a thrall or servant to the vampires. But someone is killing vampires and human classmates. Finn wants to destroy the vampires that took her mother from her and she can't help the attraction to her brooding and mysterious vampire mentor. So it is very darkly sensual. It has some interesting twists. I liked it, but I expected to love it. So yeah, quite graphic in terms of violence and like blood consumption and stuff. I don't know. I mean, maybe other people are going to love this in a way that I didn't, but it was a disappointment for me. But still three stars, like not a bad book, but disappointing because I thought it was going to be a new favorite. <sighs> Let's move on to my four star reads. There are lots of them. I think 11. I think I have like 11. First up is Huda F Cares by Huda Fahmi. This is actually not coming out till October, I want to say. Um, but I read it early and it was really fun. It is a YA graphic novel from the author of Huda F Are You. It's loosely autobiographical, but fictionalized. This one is following the main character from the last book, Huda, who is a visibly Muslim young woman wearing hijab. In this book, her parents are taking her and her sisters on a road trip to Disney World. And so she's dealing with sister dynamics, but also dealing with what it looks like to be visibly Muslim and a practicing Muslim in that situation and deal with Islamophobic sentiments from people. So there are some more difficult scenes, but also it's quite funny and I think does sibling dynamics really well. I really enjoy these a lot. And I think they're great in terms of just representation and showing her as a very normal teenager. So I gave this four stars. I liked it. If that sounds of interest, I would recommend it. I also gave four stars to Daddy and Me Side by Side by Pierce Freelon, illustrated by Nadia Fisher. This was sent to me for review from the publisher. It just came out in May and they're promoting it for Father's Day. And it's really cute. It's a really sweet picture book about this dad and his son who go on a camping trip together. And while they're they are remembering um, a grandfather who it seems has probably passed away. It's not super explicit about that, but it, from context clues, you can kind of tell. It's just really beautifully illustrated and, you know, just really like tender and sweet. And uh, yeah, if you're looking for something for Father's Day, I would check it out. Um, okay, the next thing that I read was Honey and Spice by Bolu Babalola. This is another one that I read in my Patrons Pick My TBR vlog. I listened to the audiobook, thanks to Libra FM, and I really liked this. It is a contemporary romance set in the UK that has social commentary, which I like. It's got a prickly heroine, which I like. The main reason this wasn't five stars for me is I just feel like I'm too old for it. It was one of those moments where I was like, man, this really feels like it is centered in the university experience of right now for Gen Z people. And I just don't feel like I'm in that zeitgeist anymore. And so it didn't hit for me the way that I think it might for younger people, but I still really liked it a lot. So four stars, again, more thoughts in the vlog. Then I read The Do's and Donuts of Love by Adiba Jagirdar. This I had as an audio review copy from NetGalley and it's super cute. It's a YA sapphic romance with a love triangle and a televised baking competition. And I really enjoyed it. It's high on the drama, I will say. Overall, I really liked it. And we have a fat main character who's dealing with fat phobia, but learning how to really love herself. She loves baking. She's in this competition and she lives in Ireland. And so this deals with a lot of like bigger issues in ways that I think were really good. One thing that I will say is I don't recommend the audiobook. I listened to the audiobook, but I didn't really like the narrator because she is like an American accent for being in the head of the main character, even though she's Irish. Like her family, like she was born in Ireland. Her family is Bangladeshi. I did like that element. I really liked the Bangladeshi cultural element because it's um, something that I think gets just kind of folded into Indian culture a lot of the time and it's not the same thing. So I thought that was really cool. So I really liked this four stars. Don't necessarily recommend the audiobook and just know that it is, you know, high, a little bit high drama and teens making dumb choices, but overall. It was fun. I liked it. I also gave four stars to The Time of Contempt by Anders Zajkowski. This is the 
second full-length novel in the Witcher series. I'm doing a read-along with Liana over on Chapter 3 Podcast, and we actually have a episode that just went up where we discuss this at greater length. So I'm going to point you there if you want to hear thoughts. But I enjoyed this. I think it's very nuanced. It's interesting. I like the characters, and I'm enjoying the process of reading the series. So go check out our podcast episode. I'll link it up above if you want to see it. And you're puppy. Oh, uh, thank you. Maybe don't throw it next time. My kids just got home, so maybe I will pick this back up later tonight. I will be back later this evening. All right, my children are occupied enough. Let's see if we can get a few more, <laughs> a few more books in here. This is gonna be super chaotic and long, I feel like. My next four star read was Atalanta by Jennifer Saint. This is her third book that is a retelling of Greek mythology centering female characters. I really, really loved her last two books. This I liked, but I'm gonna say it's my least favorite of them. I think I was much more invested in the second half of this book or even like last third of this book. It did some really interesting things with motherhood and identity. And I think this also has some things to say about misogyny and rape culture. And I liked the direction she took the later part of the story, but it took a while for me to be very invested in Atalanta at a character as a character. Again, I like it. I think it's interesting. Not my favorite of her books, but if you've been a fan of them, it's worth a try. I, I like how she does feminist retellings of Greek mythology that are looking at the experiences of female characters. There are other authors who say they do this and don't do it the way they say they're going to. I feel like Jennifer Saint genuinely does, and I like the way she thinks about things like motherhood and sexual violence. I also gave four stars to Ashes of the Sun by Django Wexler. This is another book that I read for the patrons pick my TBR video and I liked it quite a lot. This is basically like queer Star Wars fantasy sort of. And the author in fact explicitly says he was inspired by Star Wars to write this and I think it's doing some very interesting things in terms of exploring what it would actually be like to be the sibling left behind when one of your siblings is taken as a child to get trained because of their magical powers, sort of like the Jedi Training Academy. And what if that turns them to a darker path? So this has two perspectives of a sister and a brother who end up on opposite sides. And I liked it, but I was much more invested in the sister's perspective and timeline than the brother's, which made it a little bit of an uneven reading experience for me. But overall, I still quite liked it. And he's one of the few male authors I've read who I think does a really great job with female characters and especially sapphic relationships in a way that doesn't feel like it's fetishizing them. I, I really like this. Next is An Island Princess Starts a Scandal by Adriana Herrera. This was another one of my most anticipated books of the year. The first book in this series that's a companion novel, A Caribbean Heiress in Paris, came out last year and was one of my favorite books of the year, favorite romances. I loved it a lot. These are historical romances following Afro-Latine and Latine characters in the late 1800s in Paris. And I was especially excited about this one because it features a sapphic romance. I was like, well, if I loved the first one, I'm probably gonna love this one even more. And I have to say, I didn't love it as much, but it's still very, very good. This follows the second of the Leona friends that each of the books in the trilogy are gonna follow. Manuela is an artist and she's very vivacious, but after her last sort of hurrah in Paris for the summer, she's gonna be trapped into a marriage that she doesn't really want, but she's gonna do for the sake of her family's financial situation. But before that happens, she's in Paris and she wants to just live life, party, have have debauchery with other women, that's what she's looking for. Enter Cora Kempf Bristol, who is a duchess and a very buttoned up businesswoman who has vowed to never again let a lover interfere with her business prospects or her personal prospects. But of course Manuela is here to mess things up for her in ways she didn't expect. So they're kind of opposites in terms of personality. And this is a book that around the 50% mark does get quite steamy. So I liked that. I enjoyed the dynamic. I also really love how this is kind of 
an homage to and a love letter to the queer and sapphic communities in Paris and art communities of the time. In the author's note, Adriana Herrera talks about all of the research that she did, and it's really fascinating that Paris was a haven for a lot of people who felt like they couldn't be who they were in other places. And so I love what this is doing for illuminating that. I wasn't as deeply moved by the romance in this as I was Caribbean Heiress, which is what part of why it's not like a favorite of the year, even though I really like it. And there were a couple of quibbles with the pacing. One thing about this that I think is hard is that it kind of assumes you've read a Caribbean Heiress in Paris. Their plots happen somewhat simultaneously. And around the middle of this book, there are events that took place in a Caribbean heiress in Paris that are very, very briefly glossed over here that caused Manuela to have a change of heart about something that really change, change things for her in a big way. And I, I just feel like if you haven't read that, it feels like such a leap. And even having read that, I still felt like I was missing something. I still felt like I needed more of that kind of emotional development to move it forward. Anyway, there were some like minor things, but overall I did still really like this quite a lot and I would recommend it. I love that we're getting more sapphic historical romances and I'm excited to read the next book in the series, which is going to be following the third friend who is a female doctor. And she is very grouchy towards the guy who is obviously going to be her love interest. I won't spoil it, but I'm very excited for it. My next four star read is Cultish by Amanda Montel. This is yet another book that I read for the patrons pick my TBR video. And it is the one nonfiction book that I read this month. Really liked this. I think it's fascinating, especially if you have come out of evangelical Christianity or any kind of a high control religion. It talks about the way that language is used in cults and cult adjacent groups in good and bad ways to create in groups and out groups and to direct the way that you think about things. Again, I get into this more in the vlog, my specific thoughts about it, but I really liked this. My main issue is that I wanted something that went a little bit more in depth. This feels like a big picture overview and I wanted more from it than what I got, but I liked it, four stars. Next up, I read The Chaperone by M. Hendricks. This is a YA dystopian thriller set in a not so distant future where the conservative southern states of America have created their own new America that is rife with purity culture and really heavy gender roles for women. Girls are never allowed to be alone until they're married. They have a government mandated chaperone with them at all times pretty much. And our main character is a teen girl whose first chaperone has mysteriously died and she's been given a new one and things are starting to change with that new chaperone. I think this is very good. It's a debut novel and the main issues that I have with it have to do with the pacing and the way that the plot comes together structurally but I really like the concept. I think it's executed really well and reading it it feels like it's written by somebody who is deeply familiar with purity culture and kind of the ins and outs of it. I think this shines a spotlight on some things that are really important and I think a lot of people will like it. The main issue is that this feels like the first two books in a trilogy smashed together and that makes it a little weird. On the one hand it's got very short chapters so it's very propulsive to read and I flew through it and didn't want to put it down, wanted to keep reading and seeing what was happening, but in terms of the emotional highs and lows and payoffs it's kind of strange because you have something that feels like a natural climax and resolution, but then the book's not over. Then there's a whole more plot that takes what happens and then sort of reverses, not reverses it. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to spoil things, but it, it feels like we reach this end point and then instead of it stopping and we get a, a second book in a trilogy, it keeps going into a shortened version of the plot of a second book in a trilogy, which is weird. <laughs> so I liked this, but I'm not sure 
why that decision was made exactly. And maybe it's that publishers aren't wanting to buy trilogies, they're only wanting duologies, and so it kind of had to get smashed together. Wouldn't be shocked if that is the case. But if that is true, you can definitely tell it's true. I still liked it though, four stars. My final four star read in May is one that I think is gonna be very divisive. And I picked this up because of what Mara said about it. Listen, she and I do not always agree on thrillers. Sometimes she loves things that I hate and vice versa. But often when she says that she loved a bonkers thriller, I usually end up loving it too. And uh, that was the case here. This is The Last Word by Taylor Adams. This was my pick from Book of the Month and I, it was great. I really enjoyed it. I was so entertained by it. Basically, this is a negative review gone very, very wrong. This woman with secrets in her past is house sitting at a beachside property that's very remote. She reads a violent horror novel, hates it, and leaves a one star review, and the author gets pissed off at her in the comments. She refuses to take it down, and now she thinks he might be stalking her and then things kind of go from there. It's it's really interesting. This book feels very self-aware and intentional about what it's doing. It to the point where it's a little bit campy and very meta, but I loved it. I was super entertained by it and had a lot of fun. The one thing that kind of brought it down for me is that it does something towards the end that is more serious where it's trying to I think have a more serious note and I just don't think this is the right book for that and I don't feel like this book earned this book earned the ability to say something about what it's trying to say something for. I am going to say that this has content warnings for infertility and loss of a child as well as your kind of normal you know like home invader violent things. But that's I know a big trigger for some people. So heads up that that's in here. But overall, very entertaining. Four stars. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Okay, moving on, let's talk about my four and a half star reads. This month, I had three of them. We're, we're like moving along. Maybe I'll get this filmed before my kids can bother me. We'll see that would be nice if we can just like finish it here. I'm trying to like, you know, like, get through these quicker than usual. First four and a half star read was Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. I really, really enjoyed this. This was the book that was picked by some of my patrons as the thing they wanted to see me do a reading vlog of. So there is a reading vlog for this available to patrons and channel members at $5 a month and above. In case anybody's interested, that is now up. But this reads like cozy fantasy meets a classic adventure story. It's so enjoyable and it's the kind of thing that I could see being a real comfort read for me, something I would revisit over the years. In fact, I know I have this like really beautiful special edition but I am planning on buying the paperback when it comes out from Tor as like a reading copy but the art in this y'all the art is like so gorgeous let me just show you an example I mean like just look at that it's so pretty so this follows a young woman named Tress who comes from a poor family and she has grown up her whole life on this very small rock island that nobody is allowed to leave in the middle of an emerald sea that is not made of water but is instead made of these very dangerous spores and the spore thing is creepy as hell but also very interesting and cool and i enjoyed that element of this world there are like 12 or 13 different kinds of spores they're all different colors they do different things and you can die in really awful ways because they explode into growth if they touch water anyway really really interesting I liked that world building element. But she's lived on this rock all her life. She likes collecting cups. And she and her best friend, who is the son of a duke, have fallen in love with each other. But of course, a peasant girl is inappropriate as a marriage option. So the duke sends his son off on a voyage to go and meet princesses and find a woman to marry only for him to fall into the clutches of the sorceress. So Tress ends up sneaking onto a ship and embarking on a journey to find and save the boy that she loves. And it, this is an adventure story along the way. Sanderson has said that this was inspired by the princess bride, but what if Buttercup actually went looking for Wesley instead of just like sitting at home being sad, which I love. And this does have that vibe. It feels very timeless. I will say the humor may not work for everyone. 
I found a lot of it funny and even the things I didn't find funny I didn't mind. There was a lot of puns and kind of dad jokes and stuff which some people might find annoying but I, I thought it was charming. Also this feels very family friendly in the sense that once my kids are just a little bit older I would probably read it out loud to them and I think they would enjoy it a lot. So yeah, I really love this. I had a good time. My main quibble with it is that I did find it a bit preachy at points. And while I agree with the message of those preachy moments, they were a little bit distracting. There were a lot of them. <laughs> like once you got far way into the book, I was like, okay, this is not seamlessly weaving in to the story in the way that I might like it to. Maybe not everyone will be bothered by it. But I do see what Sanderson is trying to say, the messages he's trying to say about like inclusivity and acceptance and like religious diversity and things like that, which I think is great, um, but it does sometimes feel a little bit didactic. This also has a blind character, which I thought was really cool. I like him a lot. And he talks in the author's note about hiring a sensitivity reader for that representation, which is great. I really liked it. Four and a half stars would recommend if you like cozy fantasy. Do not recommend to Liana. I think she would hate it. So yeah. <laughs> I also gave four and a half stars to The Lost Heir by Twee T. Sutherland. This is the second book in the Wings of Fire series. My kids are obsessed with these books. My oldest is reading them on his own and then I am reading them slower aloud at night. So we finished book two. We are currently reading book three. <laughs> this is like, you're probably going to see my reviews of a lot of these. Um, I really like this. I think I actually enjoyed it even more than I did book one. It's like a little bit less violent and I think the plot comes together better. The main character in this one is Tsunami and one thing that I think is interesting about this is it's exploring what it is like to have a narcissistic parent. Somebody who is maybe unintentionally causing harm to her children and cares more about what other people think of her than anything else and I think that's a really interesting thing to be exploring in a children's book that came out quite a while ago. So I liked this four and a half stars, lots of dragons with personalities. It's fun. My final four and a half star read was a novella that was great. This is Straight by Chuck Tingle. Listen, I saw the audiobook come up to be requested on NetGalley and thought I am going to get this because I've been really excited about Chuck Tingle's first full-length horror novel coming out later this summer. It's called Camp Damascus and it's about a Christian conversion camp, like a Pray the Gateway type camp, but a horror novel. And I was like, that sounds really interesting. But if you don't know, Chuck Tingle is a kind of anonymous author who has written a lot of like, I don't, what would you call his books? They're like, gay erotica with social commentary <laughs> that are out there, right? Um, so this was my first time reading a book from Chuck Tingle. The premise of this novella sounded interesting and I thought, well, let me try this horror novella and see if, if, if that will make me more or less excited for Camp Damascus. I'm gonna tell you I'm more excited for Camp Damascus having read straight because this was great. So the premise of this is it's a post-apocalyptic horror novella where some kind of a cosmological thing a couple years prior had happened that created an outbreak of something that only affects cis straight people and for one night a year causes them to go into this murderous mindless rage where they try to kill queer people and they can like sense where they're at. So this novella is taking place a couple years later. There's been a vaccine for it. Some people have taken it. Some people haven't. Supposedly it's going to be safer this year. But this guy that we're following is planning to go out into the desert for the night with his friends and hopefully stay safe. But of course things don't necessarily go according to plan. Y'all, this was so funny and also creepy. It was great like excellent horror comedy with social commentary if you want that for pride month i really recommend checking it out if you haven't read it there are so many scenes that i like like scenes where i literally laughed out loud because they were creepy but also funny um i'll, I'll just give one brief example that's towards the beginning of the novella the main character is writing in the elevator of his building down to the floor of it and he's in the elevator with this old 
grandmother who lives on his floor and she's got this tub of homemade cookies that smell delicious and she's on her way to her son or grandson's house for the evening where she'll be locked in the basement. But the thing is is that in the hours before this cosmological event people start to get a little bit weird and so she offers him a cookie and she's like don't they smell good and he's like okay yeah sure so he reaches in to get one and it pricks his finger and he's bleeding and he looks and there's like needles and thumbtacks and stuff baked into the cookie so it's just super creepy and she looks at him with these like wild eyes and he's like oh god get me out of this elevator anyway it's great like really funny social commentary I highly recommend four and a half stars loved it Moving on, let's talk about my five star reads. Okay, we're doing really good. This is awesome. There were six of them, six five star reads. The first one is Her Good Side by Rebecca Weatherspoon. This was so good, you guys. <laughs> so good. I am really happy because you never know when people try a different age category how it's gonna go. Rebecca Weatherspoon writes a lot of adult romance and this is her first YA romance and it was fantastic. Really, really fantastic. Uh, positive plus size representation if that's something you're looking for and it's two kind of awkward late bloomer teenagers who practice date each other and of course along the way end up falling for each other it's really good. It's really good. It's cute. It's fun. It's got like good messaging. It's perfect for teenagers. It's sex positive, but also has this messaging of like consent and that it's okay to be slow and it's okay to be a late bloomer and it's okay to take your time and friendship. And it's so good. It's so good. I, I really, really loved it. Five stars. Definitely would recommend. Um, I think this lives up to the hype. I also gave five stars to The Cloud Roads by Martha Wells. It's funny that her most recent fantasy book was one of my biggest disappointments of the month, but this was another book that was in that vlog where my patrons pick my TBR, and it was such a hit. I loved it. This was one of the best things that they picked for me. It's such a unique world. I was interested. I was invested in the plot. It's got like politics. I loved the characters. It's another one that has a queer norm society and like polyamorous norm society, which is really interesting. But the Roxura, who are the main people group focused on this, operate almost like a beehive sort of where there's like one main queen and then different types of Raxura who have different like functions. Some of them are able to have babies, some of them are not fertile and follow different functions. It's just, it's really fascinating and really unique and I loved it. Five stars. I want to continue on with the series. I also gave five stars to Yona of the Dawn Volume 1. This is a manga that I'd been meaning to read for a while. I'd had it recommended to me and people were right. It's great. I want Volume 2. It, like I'm very excited about this. It's got a love triangle and betrayal and politics and I got to the end and I was like what's gonna happen next? I am on the edge of my seat. I'm so invested in the story and I hear that it only gets better. So this was great and people on my Goodreads comments seem very excited that I started this manga so I clearly need to pick up some more volumes of it. I added some to my wish list and maybe I'll try to make space to buy some because I know there's a bunch of volumes out in it but um, yeah this was very enjoyable. Really liked it. I also gave five stars to Triss's book, The Second Circle of Magic Book by Tamora Pierce. We had a live show discussion for this, which I can link up above if you haven't seen it yet. But I just I love this series so much. It is really underappreciated, amazing middle grade fantasy with found family. It's very cozy. And it's just so thoughtfully done. I can't I, I it's un really unfortunate that the series is out of print because they're so good and everybody in the read along is enjoying them too which has been really fun so um join us if you want we're going to be talking about the third book in the series Daja's book at the end of june and then we're going to eventually continue on to the second quartet as well but yeah five stars easily these are such comfort reads for me the last time i read them was like nine years ago when i broke my leg and they're they're so good they're so good anyway 
I won't gush anymore. They're beautiful. My next five star read is another picture book. This is All We Need Is Love and a Really Soft Pillow by Peter H. Reynolds and his son Henry Rocket Reynolds. This is adorable. My kids really enjoyed it. I for I they had it so I didn't show it on the video but I actually picked this up at the U.S. Book Show. This is coming out in fall of 2023, September 19th, and y'all, I love it. The artwork is beautiful. It's very vibrant, and it's these two, I don't know, monsters, I guess, cute monsters, like a dad and a kid, and it's like, all we need is love and a really soft pillow and maybe like a few things and it, it like slowly builds up all these simple things they need for like a good life together and then a storm blows most of it away but they still have each other and they're like love is still all we need it's just like really sweet and really beautiful and um yeah i think this one is gonna be such a hit it was great five stars. My final five star read of the month was our pick for Patreon book club, which I'm very excited to discuss on Saturday. This is Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater. I loved this. It took me a minute to get into the writing style, but once I did, this was just really, really, really lovely. It's another one that feels kind of more like cozy fantasy. It's like Jane Austen, but with the fae. <laughs> like that's kind of what it is. It's got some social commentary to it, which I think is really good. And the main character, I was reading it and I was like, she's gotta be neurodivergent, right? I talked about this in a video in that vlog as well. I guess I shouldn't get into all of this because, um, but in this was also part of my patrons pick my TBR video. And the thing that I found out after I posted that video is that the author of the video is herself autistic and the character is intended to be coded as autistic and that you find out in later books she has never magically healed. I love that. I love that. I loved this book. Again, I gush about it some more in that video. So go check out that vlog if you want to hear more. Finally, let's talk about my three six star reads, which is a favorite of the year. It's a good month if there's three of them. It's very exciting. The first one is also in the patrons pick my TBR video. This was obviously the biggest hit. The Lesbianist Guide to Catholic School by Sonora Reyes. Oh my god, it's so good. This was originally on my radar because of Ashley. It was gifted to me by Christopher. Thank you so much. This had me sobbing and in tears. It's really good. If you're looking for something to read during Pride Month and you haven't read this yet, go read it. It's amazing. It's a YA contemporary novel following a Latina young woman who is a closeted lesbian and she's afraid that if she comes out her family might kick her out of the house. Um, and then she finds out that her brother is secretly bisexual and has been dating a boy for the last year. And, you know, this, I think, deals really well with the fact that it is not safe everywhere for queer teenagers to be out. But also it's so beautiful and it has a romance. I just, I loved this. I was crying. Ah, <laughs> again, go check out my patrons pick my TBR vlog if you want to hear more about this was amazing. I also gave six stars to Warrior Girl Unearthed by Angeline Bully. I also had the opportunity to go and hear her talk about this. I read it, well finished reading it the morning of the event because I had an audio copy from NetGalley and so then I was like well I really want this so I ended up going. I got a signed copy. It's set 10 years after her debut novel which was also incredible. This is following Donis's niece. So the main character from that book, it's also kind of fun because we get to see Donis as an adult starting her own family and that I thought was just really fun. So but this has like a heist element to it. It's got thriller elements to it, but it's also just a contemporary story that's going to teach you a lot about the reclamation of sacred objects and ancestral remains by indigenous people. And this gets into the legal elements of it. And I learned a lot. It was really interesting and also heartbreaking to see the realities of like what are the laws but also how do museums for instance use those laws in ways that give indigenous communities sort of a runaround um, when they don't want to return sacred objects or ancestral remains so this was really fantastic and I loved it. Highly recommend it. I, I loved the main character in this book and seeing her growth arc 
like there was a lot happening in this. It's amazing. It also gets into talking about the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women, which is really important. If you haven't heard about it, you should go look it up. Um, I would recommend maybe Kim from Native Lady Book Warrior. She's on Instagram that are really good, but I had to change my camera battery, but we're back to talk about my final book that I read and my final six star read. And I apologize in advance because, um, this is not actually going to be out until October. So I'm sorry, <laughs> but you could pre-order it. It's really, really good. This is a graphic novel called If You'll Have Me by Uni. And y'all, oh my god, this is the most adorable new adult sapphic romance graphic novel I have seen. It is so freaking cute. It's like I'm kind of obsessed with it. It's so good. So this follows a black young woman who is in her first year in college. She's never had a girlfriend. She's super nerdy and quirky and introverted and shy, um, but like really, really sweet. And she is crushing on this tall, stunning Asian woman who is known for seducing lots of women and they strike up a friendship that leads to a romance and it's just like it's just so cute and seeing them have miscommunication and then figure out the problem and solve it and like open up to each other and eventually become vulnerable with each other and like oh Oh, it's so cute. It's so freaking cute. I love it. And I love the artwork. It, the author is the illustrator as well. And ah, <laughs> it's just like, so cute. I don't know what else to tell you about it. But um, if that sounds up your alley, highly recommend. It's coming out in October. You could pre-order it or you could go to her Instagram and look at all the art that she's done because she's actually like the the graphic novel is technically YA and so it keeps it like a little sensual and it's sex positive but it's not I wouldn't call it erotic whereas like on her Instagram some of the artwork that she's done is like a little like a step above what is in the graphic novel either way it is just the cutest most adorable thing and I loved it so highly recommend there you go. Those are all 31 of the things that I read in the month of May. You know, we had some really big disappointments. This might be the most disappointments I've had in a month of books that I was really anticipating. But I also read a lot of really great books and had more new favorites than usual. So you know what, we're gonna call it a win. And I am looking forward to June. I'm hoping it's going to be an even better month. I would love to hear from you in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for question of the day, let's talk about disappointments. Tell me about a book that you were anticipating, you thought you were gonna love it, and then it just did not live up to your expectations. Maybe it was still an okay book. Maybe it was a terrible book but it wasn't what you were hoping for. Let me know about an experience like that in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you wanna see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.